Hello, everybody, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Champions D Podcast Record Club, where each week one of us picks a record to review for the other people to listen to, and then we all review it here on this wonderful little show. And this week, it's not as though this is like a formal thing that we've been doing, obviously, because we've been doing it very scattered uh, over the past couple of months, but in uh, sort of the anticipation for the reunion album of Porcupine Tree, Close Your Continuation, which is coming out at the end of June, we have been reviewing the post-2000 uh, records that the band put out sort of in leading up to it to sort of chart the band's journey. Like the golden the era, all. essentially. Yeah, sort of the, the golden run of records because all of us are fans of the band and sort of one uh, notch on this particular belt that we have not covered up until this point is, of course, Fear of a Blank Planet, which just so happened to have recently turned 15 years old and just so happens to be an album that we like an awful lot. Uh, I've talked about it a lot in the past, but we've never actually gotten to properly review it. And August, I think it was sort of your record club slot that we managed to fit this into. Fear of a Blank Planet is in fact my personal favorite Porcupine Tree album. It was the first record of theirs, which I had actually heard. And it was pretty early on into my, uh, I guess you could say musical journey. And I, I had encountered this record primarily off of the back of Jake and Morgan. You two had hyped it up substantially, not just this record, but the band as a whole. And one day I just randomly happened across a full upload on YouTube, uh, gave it a listen, and instantly fell in love with its unique hypnotic at times, both progressive metal leaning and progressive rock leaning atmosphere. It's amazing instrumentation, as well as, I think, a, a trend in Wilson's work, a reverence for classic prog, but unlike a lot of his other work, taking that reverence up a notch and featuring some really important musicians to this sound as i am sure we will get into eventually that's fear of a blank planet in a nutshell but we'll yeah. get into our more specific thoughts without further ado i think uh, a good place to start talking about this is and especially because it's like what the fourth or fifth porcupine tree record we've done a record club on is to just talk about the personnel mm -hmm. involved in this album not even just the featured collaborators although they are their appearances are notable, but specifically the members of the band at this point and how kind of locked in and really in sync with each other and also able to express their own sort of idiosyncratic styles You they are. I mean, you have obviously Stephen Wilson and obviously the incredible drummer Gavin Harrison, whose work we, we, all, we love Gavin Harrison. We've talked about him a lot on this podcast, but I want to shout out who I think is maybe the MVP of this record, and that is the uh, keyboard and synthesizer player, Richard Barbieri, who's always been a, a really integral part of Porcupine Tree um, on all of their major records, being with the band, you know, basically since their early days. Um, but I don't think we've ever really, like, given him his, his own distinct fear due. But one of the things that I really appreciate about Fear of a Blank Planet um, and it's not something that's completely different from other Porcupine Tree records, but I would say here, maybe more than before, there is a, a focus, a greater focus, a greater incorporation of synthetic textures, of a general atmosphere of sort of digitized fuzz. And that ties into the concept of this record as well, which, we'll get, we, which we can get into as well. But uh, one of the things about the concept of this record, this sort of uh, the digital chaos, the kind of disillusionment of, of a youth existing in a kind of incredibly online space where they're desensitized to, you know, uh, the stimuli in the world around them and their interactions are, you know, no longer meaningful and, and personal, but, but kind of an imposed distance by, you know, the, the en encroaching omnipresence of the internet, essentially. And, and so, and I have thoughts on that concept. But um, 
one of the things that the that the band smartly do to i guess enhance or relate that to what's going on musically is to have this increased sort of synthetic presence the sense of kind of dread hanging over this entire album that it is very very in integral to that is the keyboard and synthesizer work of Richard Barbieri so it's really one of those points where not only are you getting another great sort of prog metal prog rock record from uh, Porcupine Tree but you are getting as August said more synthesis with and more communion with those real 70s prog aspects of you know what made that genre foundational with the increased presence of the keyboards and synthesizers and because those to me have always been a, a really core facet of prog rock that don't get it talked about as much as you know the kind of epic guitars or whatever so one of the things that makes fear of a blank planet so appealing to me as a listening experience is how it really kind of continues heading in that direction compared to records like dead wing and uh in absentia yeah, uh, what's notable about this sort of era of the band right now, for those of you who might not remember everything, considering we are doing these videos a bit spread out, but at this point, Porcupine Tree are in their Imperial era, I think, past, you know, um, we have that final major addition to the lineup in the form of In Absentia when uh, Gavin Harrison formally joined the band. And now we sort of get a run of records that are a lot heavier, a lot more progressive, are a lot more in keeping with where progressive rock was sort of in the moment, which really carried the band onto a new wave of success, even though it didn't put them on the mainstream by any means. But this is an album to me that sort of emphasizes the directions they were going in. These final two records here are sort of the emphasized extremes of the band, because this is six songs, even though it's 51 minutes Whereas the, the final record, The Incident, is a huge, really long, probably too long, album that is kind of, you know, it's really blown up. You have these really like, like lots of ideas, lots of new sonic directions, lots of interesting stuff that they do. But here, everything is taken and it's a little bit more concentrated. Everything is sort of distilled into this really pure essence of a record. And I think there's no better place to start than on the first track, if we're going to talk about the album, which is the title track, Fear of a Blank Planet, Fear of Blank which Planet. it's fucking like, I mean, this is this is going to be the most difficult part is that like um, on something like Dead Wing or In Absentia, it's kind of difficult to not just take every song here and just go, God, it's fucking good. But of the many porcupine tree openers uh and there are no shortage of great ones this one may be the most immediately arresting i might be basic and say that probably dead wing and uh light bulb sun and maybe in absentia have the ones that i think i hold maybe a bit closer to my own heart but i feel like this does this is like a perfect microcosm for the whole album and how Absolutely. structurally adventurous this is and how like it basically gives you a guiding tour of everything that you're going to experience throughout the track list and like even in contrast to pre those previous openers from those previous records like those are sort of big bombastic tracks that kind of like knock your door down at a certain point or really like mm -hmm. you're listening to porcupine tree this is more like sustained dread like is the feeling like i used that word before Absolutely. dread, and I, yes. that is a, a feeling that permeates the entire record but the opening track here fear of a blank planet in particular is this like you know it has this sense of like forward momentum to it like just about the entire time that you know you feel like you are on a speeding bullet train and you cannot stop okay let's get into the the concept of this record because i have concept. capital t thoughts on it but oh i know you do bitch yeah we'll fight we'll fight that, that's fine um so yeah i talked kind of forecasted this it is about the kind of encroaching omnipresence of the internet and the disillusionment that that kind of induces in people who spend a lot of their time on it. Of course, this being a record that came out in 2007, it's kind of quite prescient in that way. And so a lot of what uh, Stephen does lyrically, a lot of what Stephen does thematically here uh, is in concert with the music to kind of emphasize that. And so you have this sense of like being trapped within this kind of like... Uh, self-reinforcing kind of downward spiral essentially and there's like a an obvious nine inch nails pun i could make there which is not just because of the words downward spiral but also because like this to me is the most nine inch nails-esque uh porcupine tree record and i'll explain what oh, I mean. oh totally i'll explain 
that in more detail as I get into uh, spe specific songs in this record that evoke that band for me. And it has some of the same sorts of limitations in terms of like how well I think concept is realized. And I guess I can't really dance around this any longer. My kind of principal complaint with this record, uh, and I want to forecast this by saying that it's not something that significantly detracts from my enjoyment of the record, because I think this is a great album. But it is something that I think makes it difficult for me to consider this one of the most holistically absolute best porcupine tree records and this is like a weird thing because Stephen Wilson has done a lot of music where he is presenting his view of the world in a way that is you know heavily imbuing a certain perspective and a certain set of emotions and, and feelings about the things that are going on around him now I'm not even talking about his more recent stuff where he really kind of goes into the deep end of his like incredibly annoying polemics I'm talking about like moments on porcupine tree records leading up to this where you get a sense of Stephen Wilson's let's say uh, less than charitable view of society and I mean you would think about songs like uh, The Sound of Music or Halo for instance great songs where you do get that a, a particular perspective that if it were to be emphasized or leaned into for an extended period of time could become a bit grating um, but it, they get away with it because of how you know uh, muscular and intense and, and, and really well composed the songs are the issue with Fear of a Blank Planet is not just that you are in this mind state of, of Stephen Wilson, who has this very particular perspective on the things that he's singing about. It's the fact that what you're getting here is a concept record about how young people are affected by being, you know, locked inside this insular world that stops them from being able to have like actual human connections and keeps them kind of online and, and wired in and whatever and there's some really potent and powerful ideas and and thoughts within that and, and some of them do appear on this record but for the most part the thing that holds me back from fully thinking this is like a capital m masterpiece is the fact that steven doesn't seem to respect the characters that he or the character that he's singing about and it's it, it, it has a kind of atmosphere of victim blaming almost or at least like a kind of atmosphere of resentment against the people that he seems to be singing about as being so you know oppressed by the internet there's this weird mentality that comes through on this record that I can't quite get past fully and I want to, I didn't want to get into that straight away, but I guess I have. So I'll acknowledge that up front and then compliment it by saying that here you have a masterclass in an album that is so instrumentally outrageously good that he can basically get away with that. <laughs> and I don't know, you probably disagree with me uh, to about to the extent to which Stephen is being condescending yes. on this record. And I'd love yes. to hear an alternate perspective. But to me, listening to it, and I listened to it multiple times this week, it very much came off with this kind of sour attitude that I couldn't quite shake while listening to it. And there was an extent to which it did detract from my overall experience just a tad. So that's where I come from. And I'm very, I'm very much open to being rebuked. Uh, I believe if anyone could do it, you too can. Well, I mean, see, that's the thing is that I don't entirely like, it's not as if this is like something that's like blindsiding me necessarily, but the only thing I really disagree with is the fact that it is in fact, Stephen Wilson's perspective because on this album, it's not. The main character of this album, this is an entire, this is an album entirely written in first person. Yeah. And in I fact, know. that's what this album does so well for me is that this is sort of a development off of the direction that they were going in something like Dead Wing, where whereas Dead Wing's approach works for Dead Wing flawlessly, this is a A, B, C tight linear narrative, a legitimate actual story concept record mainly through the development like of the eyes of a child specifically a child who has bipolar disorder uh who is you know all, all these things you know he's like he's on his computer all the time he's like you get a very vivid portrait of him in the opener fear of a blank planet and 
he talks about consistently being, you know, overly medicated and how pills desensitize him and how pornography doesn't stimulate him and the inclinations and urges he gets when he sees a gun in his father's closet or when he goes and sees the shooting range when he's out at the mall or something. And all of these disdains and urges and angers and all, all these tiny little sort of bugbears that Stephen has are certainly manifesting within this character but to me it's with the fact that this is very like this is not a disparagement of the record on my pen is that this is very juvenilely written is that this like all of these first person perspectives which I appreciate just because you know I'm somebody who writes from the first person perspective of teenagers an awful lot as somebody who's trying to man and as someone who's been this teenager that Stephen is writing about I, I mean, like, again, it, it's not exactly elegant because, you know, Stephen never is with stuff like this. I didn't really imagine it to be nuanced, but then again, no one does, because if you know what you're in for with something like this, you, why would you expect that? But I, I guess the thing is here is that it's not a skin deep portrayal for me, is that the the character at the heart of all of this is that we see the vulnerable side of him in songs like My Ashes and Sentimental, and we see a full-fledged portrait of him where it's just kind of like all of these things, they're not intrinsic to his problems. Like his problems are strictly emotional. Uh, they specifically go into a lot of them during anesthetize, which I mean, we'll just kind of shove that to the side for later. But oh, don't worry. for me anyway, this is an experience that fully inhabits you in the headspace of another character. And I think that sort of this is the point at which Porcupine Tree become both synergistic in how they tell their story with sound and how Stephen tells the story with lyrics. Because for as much as we love a lot of Stephen's songwriting and lyricism in the past, just that sometimes it doesn't exactly, it just kind of, it'll hold a song back or it'll, you know, be a net neutral for it. But this is one of the few times where I think it truly does end up complementing the material. It's because I really do buy the character that's being spoken about here. Whereas the character on Deadwing, for example, um, is just kind of a facilitation for Steven himself, I think. But this to me feels like the most fully realized world, uh, which is what makes the, the musical direction so forceful and encompassing yeah. and immersive i i guess if i am to speak on it i think i think a lot of what i get isn't so much condescension but i feel a lot of what i experience with this character is to me it feels like the self-hatred that like that's that's what i think it is more so uh like self-hatred that is just naturally arising from being a very detached and ultimately depressed person is I that's at least how I read the album and I think like you say Jake uh, those moments of humanity like my ashes or uh, sentimental are both great compliments to this this grander vision of of the character and and yeah you know subtlety has never been Stephen's forte even on beautifully emotional albums like hand cannot erase yeah Th hey, that and is look, and look subtlety is not something i i expect in, in pro oh i didn't uh, say you were yeah, yeah no so. yes and, it's and, it's just a note on steven himself in personally general. as yeah. a as a creator mm. this Sorry. actually makes me think a lot august of something i think you'd appreciate is this makes me think a lot of serial experiments lane which is a story, it's an anime specifically, about a character who basically becomes, like it, it was basically made at the onset of the internet. And it has a lot of really dark, oppressive, overbearing energy and atmosphere. A lot of the stuff that Satoshi Kone would talk about, which I think of Satoshi Kone, Serial Experiments Main, Stephen Wilson, all of these things occupy the exact same space in my brain because they all talked about the same things. They all talked about the onset of technology to near the turn of the century. And that's a story that's about someone basically becoming so involved with the world in an online space that they become the internet, essentially. And hatred for others becomes hatred of the self. And that's, I think, what August was talking about, is that that's why all of the anger on here feels so 
very juvenile, but also very real. And it's manifested so well into so many of the guitar parts on here. Yeah. Like, I, I think the anger is almost more or less part and parcel an excuse to go as stupidly hard as they do on songs like Anesthetize or Fear of a Blank Planet, where you just peel back and you just gnarl these tones to where they sound as ugly and as dark as they sounded on Deadwing and in Absentia and even a little bit further. I would say that like this isn't the darkest album this band has made, but it's certainly not far from it. Fear of a Blank Planet is like a really great, I mean, it, it, like Riley kind of implied, it's sort of a declaration of purpose. It's a really long opening track. It has like this winding structure. It really introduces you to the character really well, talking about, uh, you know, him being stoned in the mall and stuff and, uh, you know, the the way, what he values and sort of uh, how pills have kind of got him shut off from yeah. reality oh, and gosh. pornography. I love, I love the way that the synthesizers are incorporated really well in the chorus particularly to give a real because like when i think of this opening track like the mental image of of just haze and smoke is conjured Mm -hmm. up so perfectly like this song is almost picturesque and it's just blunt immediate lyricism coupled with that instrumental palette and yeah, the electronic embellishments are great. I think that intro is kind of fun where you hear the keyboard the board clicking. Yeah. Yeah. And then you get the, <laughs> the fucking like 2000s dance track laugh before the song starts. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> It really actually, not just because August is wearing a tool shirt and because we made a joke about it, but it reminds me of On Lateralis. You can hear that sound effect at the start of one of the songs that's like, it's used for a garage door opening in the first Scream movie. Like it's a stock sound effect that every single like video editing software thing comes with. And whenever I hear that, that's the first thing I think of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like... Oh, I see. They were just like, oh, we can just use this as a, like Steven in the studio. Oh, we can use this little plug in sound right here and we can just put it right here. Ah, yeah. that, that works. <laughs> that you know, the idea that we're trying to go with. Like, For as much as we're talking about the uh, the structure here is that this has one of my favorite really uh, catchy and also emotionally resonant um, sort of chorus refrains. With the How can I be sure I'm here? The pills that I've been taking confuse me. I need to know that someone sees that. There's nothing left. I'm simply I'm not here. It's like he desires something that's like, it, it's not that he's just like, oh, I want to feel something. It's like, no, he wants someone else to show agency and connect with him. And I, I don't know, I, that's part of it that really just sort of develops the emotional side of the album that really like gets me. I also like the part where he says he, uh, uh, this part, it, it's like, it's it's very inelegantly written, but it also feels like the most emblematic of what it's trying to do with the character writing is that it's, my friend says that he wants to die. He's in a band, they sound like Pearl Jam. The clothes are all black and the music is crap. And like, I get that's kind of off-putting, but at the same time, it's like, first of all, Steven loves Pearl Jam. Uh, so, you know, factually, he does not think the Pearl Jam's crap. Uh, secondly, it's just kind of like, there is sort of an understanding there of just like, you know, teenagers trying to sound like grunge music in I mean, the look, 2000s. There, there are hooks on this song, like uh, the Xbox is a God to me thing. Like, look, yes, some of that is corny as all hell. I will admit that fully, but it is also so fucking catchy that I do not care. Like, look, for you can say You're those right. hooks are though you can say those fucking hooks are stupid, but I think the fact that you remember them well enough is enough to prove that they're effective at what they're going for. Yeah, I mean, I I, I sure remember that AJR album. I'm just kidding. That was bait. Don't go for it. Um, uh. No, no, I want to clarify that wasn't, something. That wasn't bait. My insides just caramelized. I feel like I'm going to shit. Ugh. I want to clarify something. Um, I'm sure that this hasn't been misinterpreted, but I want to clarify it anyway. My uh, issue, issues even feel too strong, but my, I guess, limitations with the lyricism of this album have nothing to do with lines like Xbox is a god to me or the datedness of it or whatever. Like, I can fully get on board with that. 
and to a certain extent as well, like the, the inelegance of the writing definitely reflects the, the kind of mindset and the fact that this is being written from the perspective of a, of a teenager, right? So you do get some artistic license there for some of the clunkiness and in, in certain senses it kind of enhances the effect and the That's power of the end, perspective right? that you're in. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think that there is, uh, I don't know, I'm not even going to linger on this too much because I think that what you said is, is a really, really strong counterpoint. And I don't really have this opinion strong enough to for it to detract that much for the record. But I do feel that there is a little bit of, I think that Stephen could have gone a little bit further. I think that Stephen could have uh, dived a little bit more deeply into, but he's very clearly and 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 I think purposefully decided to write in a, more shallow way and that's not necessarily a bad thing because he's decided to inhabit this perspective and communicate these ideas through that mindset it just doesn't always 100% land for me but I will say that the kitschiness of this album I mean and there are a lot of ways in which this album is kind of dated there's a lot of ways in which this album is very much you know, leaning into its era but also leaning into certain conventions of eras prior to it and that kitsch value, which I understand that a lot of people hate about modern prog rock and even older prog rock, I love that kitsch. And we both love, we all love that kitsch. And that aspect of it is one of the most appealing and even endearing aspects of a record like this is, I mean, I, I started out this review by praising the synthesizer and keyboard stuff, which is musically the most kitsch aspect of prog rock. And yet it is the thing that is linked into the most here that I love the most musically. I and mean, when I think of this album- Let's make that abundantly clear is that if you think the synthesizers on this album don't sound good, get new ears, bro. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like When I think of this album, the first thing I think of usually is that intro to anesthetize where you have like the xylophone mm. and you have the really kind of warm sort of chords that are being played. And you of course have Gavin Harrison just going unnecessarily hard in this quiet part oh, of the song. Um, but, and when the guitar comes in on anesthetize, it's like, and you're like, yeah, and, and so let's okay, let, let, let's talk about anesthetized yeah, ways. So yeah, for all of my reservations about line. certain aspects of this record, anesthetize is the one moment where none of it matters. Moment, the one part of this record where nothing matters because everything is perfect. I don't, I don't even have the slightest quibble about a single element of anesthetize. It is absolute musical perfection for seventeen minutes and forty-two seconds. And I can, if I've listened. Yes. Porcupine Tree song. And probably the Porcupine Tree song, oh, I don't know, maybe the one I've heard the most. I've watched so many videos of like uh, the band playing this live. I've watched like, uh, you know, videos of, of Gavin's sort of drumming and I've watched like reactions yeah. to Gavin's drumming. And I've I mean, watched so many yeah, me It's insane enough that this is like a staple of their live shows because of just how technically indulgent the song is if oh, you and haven't heard the so live album for this record specifically it is worth like for if you like this and somehow dislike that you're uh, whatever man but this the version of like for as much as i love this album and uh, i am of course going to sing the praises of every part of it because i do like if for those who may have missed it in the past is that this has been vying for my favorite porcupine tree album since basically i heard it and i only definitively came to the conclusion that light bulb sun is my favorite somewhat recently but this is pretty handily my second favorite but one of the cool things about this is that the live album version of this, which I believe actually might be the live uh, version of this is actually called Anesthetized. Yeah, the live record um, Anesthetized. Oh, they yeah. play, they play. The live album fun. of Fear of a Blank Planet is better. I don't know how, but they just like decided to do all of this and a bunch of other shit and they did it better. Yeah. And it's, 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 fucking like if you're not the per type of person who listens to live albums you need to become that kind of person <laughs> because there's nothing about the live recording that holds it back like these guys like progressive rock live albums are the easiest to listen to is because they have virtually like the best ones anyway have virtually no difference when it comes to the quality of the recording itself 
and because all of the performers are just so tight and locked in with each other. It's like the only thing I could say is that maybe Steven gets one or two vocal performances on this part on the studio recordings that are a little bit better. But even then, the difference is basically marginal. But I mean, anesthetize is like this is a mandatory top five porcupine tree song and if it's not like veering up on the top three then people are going to look at you a little bit questionably just because like I remember listening to this when I first heard it in like I was in the middle of like I was in college and I was in class uh and I was listening to the album like after a lecture and I was just kind of sitting there and I was listening to it and I just kind of got out my phone and texted Morgan and I was just like dude, I think this album might be perfect. (laughs) It's just like, what? I didn't even send context. He was like, what fucking album are you talking about? Like, I expected him to know. But this is like, I'm trying to think, like, my favorite part of this shifts frequently. Like, there's the the three-minute blaring noise shit that happens at the very beginning of it. There's the Alex... Lifeson solo, which if you haven't seen our guitar solo's video, go check that out. It's really good. Uh-huh. Uh, Kid Gloves, by the way, is winning that poll. <laughs> pretty, yeah, pretty I saw that. Fast That's right fucking now. sick. <laughs> um, but Alex Lifeson of Rush shows up on this to deliver easily not not only just like a good Alex Lifeson solo, but one of the best solos that one of the best guitarists who's ever lived has ever done on this song. That is already like if you took the solo out of this song, it's just like that's a shame. But the rest of the song is so fucking good. Like, oh my God. The solo is not even my favorite part of the song. Like it might not even be one of my top three favorite parts of the song. Just because like, there's just not even in the top half of the song. Descending riffs where Gavin's just like, he's got like this drum fill that's just going on for a stupidly long amount of time. And then Steven's just like, and you're just like, yeah, yeah. And then the part where it comes in with just this like, you're in, you're so into this like incredible like jam instrumentally and then like all of a sudden like he just pulls out this incredibly catchy chorus that just happens mm-hmm. and you're like holy shit holy mtv like <laughs> she's just completely Only everything is it just so completely weird. blindsides you like oh i'm listening to this massive pro jam and all of a sudden he just fucking punches you in the face with a great hook it's like it's one of the his song has best vocal performances. I love the way Steven actually sounds on this. Like when he delivers those like really kind of eerie vocals where I, I don't want to like write a lot of the lyrics off here because shit like this, where it's the dust in my soul makes my me feel the weight in my legs, my head in the clouds. I'm zoning out. I'm watching TV, but I find it hard to stay conscious. I'm totally bored, but I can't switch off. If you know what it's like to take antidepressants that make you feel like shit, let me tell you, this hits really fucking hard because that kind of gray haze is evoked here so well. And then you get the fucking the only apathy from the pills in me. Oh, God, it's so this, this is a, a, an amazingly written song as well. There, there's just like an incredible sense of menace here that like simmers and builds into these emotional outbursts that you really do feel like you're witnessing someone have an actual breakdown and it becomes kind of uncomfortable at parts, but God, it's so good. There's the, the part, the, the water so warm that day, I was counting out the waves and I followed their short life as they broke on the shoreline. I could, I could see you, but I couldn't hear you. Like, oh God, some of this shit is just, like so forlorn and agonized and pain and it's really really effective yeah again no notes on the lyricism of this track i think this is the the crystallization of the best aspects of this record and of the most human aspects of the songwriting i think and um oh, that's kind of a poor description but just the, the most i guess resonant to me anyway and it's also the song also manages to pull off something that very few songs that try to do it can really do which is that um you get the guitar solo and i'm not talking about the life one but later in the song where it's a guitar solo that's just reprising the melody of the chorus Mm -hmm. as a guitar solo and i can only think of one other occasion where that's worked which is smells like teen spirit um and (laughs) and it's like this it's it's a very kind of like because it can come across as like kind of 
recycling a melodic motif and to a solo form can just kind of come across as really lazy or, or like badly uh, done. A best way to emphasize your point is that a, a band that does that an awful lot is Weezer. Yeah, yeah, fuck, fuck. Oh yeah, but it, it really works here. And um, I really I, brought I, up I love... Weezer in a porcupine tree video. Yeah, I want to hang saying. myself too. It's he's, fine. He's the person wearing a fear inoculum t-shirt <laughs> in a porcupine tree video. I mean, I didn't say that wasn't embarrassing either, but at least there's <laughs> a joke to be made there. No, exactly. And there, we've made it. But yeah, great song. Very, very true. It's almost like that is the only thing like that's the only tool left in the toolbox to do at this point in the song to where it's just like, I mean, I guess that we should do this now and then they do. And it's just kind of like, you know what? I mean, yeah. No, yeah. I mean, it's it's just insane how this song throws fucking everything at the wall and it all sticks somehow. And this even is like, a song, and this is a song that says shouldn't the xylophone. work. Yeah. Starts with a goddamn, this song shouldn't work. Like, if you write this down on paper, it sounds like shit, sounds like garbage, doesn't make any sense. But then you hear it and it's like, oh my God, he's he's perfected it, music. It's kind of got like a space <laughs> rock vibe to it at points, which I really love yeah. because I love space rock mm. in general. And I also appreciate the fact that thematically, uh, obviously with the title of the song, you have a very kind of clear concept of what the song was about and you get that reflected in the very underrated final stretch of the song where it kind of mellows out and yeah. you get a sense of like the musical representation of the, the numbing that's sort of being sung about like the mania subsides and that just the character enters this fugue state and it, and it's a great piece of, of uh, musical representation of what's going on lyrically and of course it flows really really beautifully into uh, the next part of the record where I, I think you get a more sort of forlorn a more sort of um, I guess emotionally acute section of music with this song and then way out of here i think like this is the, the the section in the middle of the record where i feel like the most sort of genuine humanity coming through in the writing uh and, and some of the melodrama being peered back a little bit and, and i really appreciate that um uh, i would yeah. before we get into that fully i would like to pull back a little bit because we did not talk about my ashes which is between yeah uh, fear of blank song. and this anesthetize which for me does kind of pull out like like fear of a blank planet and anesthetize are two songs that they are multifaceted in their structures and they don't just go hard all the time but their real aim is to build up and really have these kind of blood pumping invigorating crazy ass moments that just kind of floor you but my ashes is the first moment of real contemplation it just kind of uh it, it's kind of a plaintive sort of opening you know you have the piano here and the sort of acoustic guitar strum. yeah it's like really that's, plaintive oh, that's, and that's such a nice moment how you have that like i think that's something i also just to interject about the sequencing that's so fun about this album is that it it bounces around between intenseness and calmness in a way that I think I initially didn't connect with a lot but as time has gone on I really appreciate how how dutiful those transitions are between these just high highs and low lows real and I mean once again musically evocative of what the character is going through having ADD ADHD or whatever and bipolar disorder of this just never feeling like you can have a center it's either one of two extremes it's really really interesting i think and and really it feels like prog rock is such a perfect genre to carry out this idea this kind of adhd concept and it's almost astonishing that it it hadn't really been done before this point to my knowledge if you know a fucking album before this that does, please comment. Do, do I mean, and it, please. Yeah, but point is, to comment on my ashes, it's just the way that's put into the album feels like, it feels like the most no shit thing that takes mm -hmm. so much thought. Yeah, and I feel like it's really kind of maximalized on too, just because this is some of the best, like another point on the album where I just think the writing here is just, really good the 
the the sort of first verse the all the things that i needed i wasted my chances i found myself wanting when my mother and father gave me their problems which and i interpret as being sort of a uh uh sort of how um mental illness most commonly the ones that the boy is suffering from are hereditary uh, I accept them the all, nothing ever expected, but I was rejected, but I came back for more. And my and this is one of my favorite moments on this album is the chorus here, which is just beautiful. Like Steven's soaring vocals on here is again, one of his best vocal moments just ever. The, my ashes drift beneath the silver sky where a boy rides on a bike, but never smiles. And my ashes fall on the things we said on a box of photographs under the bed. And it's just all of these really specific lyricism like all of this lyricism that's really specific and talking about these really imagistic ideas and you know maybe things that you don't entirely understand the significance of but you know that the person singing about does and that kind of stuff is really just sort of uh kind of what makes everything lock into place for me is that this does feel like the sort of moment for him that allows him uh, to breathe. I also love the part in the sort of next verse, which is a kiss that will burn me and cure me of dreaming. I was always returning. Just the way he describes the sensations that he feels is continuously really, really captivating to me. Uh, and, and I just really wanted to shout out my ashes just because that's a moment on the album that always really caught me off guard after the really high energy bounce back of Fear of a Blank Plan it and this to ties which you know they really do dominate the discussion on this album but yeah. i i think the for as much as deep cut favorites can be on an album with six tracks i do think that songs like my ashes and sentimental for that matter are deeply underrated moments i will say uh, a kiss that will burn me and cure me of dreaming is a fucking deaf heaven ask lyric and i love it it's like oh, so God, like yeah. melodramatic but also like really poetically beautiful at the same time and, and it just treads that line really well there is yeah for all of for my quibbles about certain aspects of the lyricism here and i feel like i've almost overemphasized that at this point there are a lot of these beautiful little couplets that come through i think maybe if i were to point out um aside from the title track a moment where i think the lyricism is a little bit less substantive or a little bit shallower than the best moments of this album it would be the song sentimental which i do like quite a lot i think it's a very pretty track um but i think it's probably pretty handily the least substantive one here for me um that said it is you know it doesn't really detract from my enjoyment of the record all that much and i think it provides some needed balance between the kind of gigantic enormity of anesthetize and then a song that i know jake is one of your absolute favorite porcupine tree songs and a song that if it were to come straight after anesthetize i think it would just be too much to handle and it's really oh, yeah. beautifully positioned in this record that of course being the song way out of here which features sound effects contributions from robert fripp it is pretty handily i oh, would boy. say pretty handily i would say one of the most emotionally devastating porcupine tree songs and i'll let jake i'll let you get into exactly why well, that is first of all First lyric, baby, Stephen Wilson, train, mention, counter, yeah. ding. Yeah, here we <laughs> but, go. Um, after, we, after we have that out of the way, um, yeah, Way Out of Here is my favorite song on the record. As ridiculous as it is to say that anesthetize, which is not an out, like, it's not a song where I would just be like, well, it's, you know, it's this great, perfect porcupine tree song, but it's not my favorite on the album. Uh, because it's like, it's vying for it, it's close. But Way Out of Here is the one that makes me feel the most and this is just sort of like this is the perfect climax in the narrative point where it's like sort of like and all of the journey here is very internal like I always interpret this as sort of like a dream that the narrator goes into once he falls asleep and it's sort of like you know you have the dreams where it's sort of like you relive a day in backward like backwards in your head and this is sort of what I picture it just because a lot of the imagery to me is very evocative of just a normal day in someone's life um but this is where like the first kind of moment on it where it's like, I can't take the staring and the sympathy and I don't like the questions. How do you feel? How's it going in school? Do you want to talk about it? Which have always kind of gutted me just because it's like, 
I have been asked these three questions before in reference to what this narrator has been talking about. And no, when you're a kid and you feel like this, you don't want to talk about all of this shit. And you hate having to be asked about it all the time because you don't know how to feel. And this song is about externalizing the frustration that you feel when you don't know how to feel about it. And the chorus, which is super simple. It's just way out, way out of here, fade out fade out vanish but very big way street Stephen spirit vibes from radiohead in that refrain oh man i'm so glad you made that connection because i never would have but this and street spirit feel like they have so much in common even in like the the level of energy in each song respectively is very different but the way it contrasts with the song like in itself is very similar and just the way steven sings here he's just he's borderline screaming this shit just the way he holds that note and the way his voice kind of like achingly breaks to hold it it's so good and when you hear him perform it live it's it's even better and then of course there's i'll try to forget you and i know that i will in a thousand years or maybe a week i'll burn all your pictures and cut out your face and the shutters are down and the curtains are closed and I've covered my tracks, disposed of the car, and I'll try to forget even your name and the way that you look and you're sleeping and dreaming of this. And it's like he's trying to disassociate to get away from himself so that he can break off and try to like live a different life. And it's just gutting. The way he's using this particular aspect of like the narrative and the way that he's feeling and shifting between these polar extremes that August was talking about earlier that the album does so well. It's just, this is a perfect, again, a, this, this is why in my opinion, this is like, while my connection and emotion runs deeper with light bulb sun, this is why in my opinion, this is Porcupine Tree's greatest accomplishment is that what it does with its music and what it does with its themes it manages to execute with a level of synergy that basically no band has ever been able to, to do quite this well in this genre. And, and it does so in such a unique way, in a way that I haven't really heard of before. And God, the way the guitar sounds at the end of this song, it's so, it's, it's fucking enormous sounding, oh, first of all. Like, like howling. Is, just is the, the like when he I says can... the way out and he just holds on it and it's just like and you're just like you feel like you're like like waves of sound are just like crashing on you and it's just like ah oh, shit I mean, like on headphones this sounds massive enough like mm -hmm. and in a car jesus christ you're just in one of those experiences this is like you have one of those moments where you just forget you're real for a minute. You know what I mean? Oh, no. It's just a total, like, space out, like, transportative. It's because it's such an emotional song that, like, it's really simple. The parts that make it are, like, it's really fundamental stuff, but it's the energy. It's just the level of bravura this is all executed with. It's just I don't get a feeling this intense and fiery and forlorn and sad it's like this is this is like the climactic moment in like a fucking like fantasy movie where someone's slaying a dragon but the dragon is them it, it's just it's so perfectly executes like the stakes of its own narrative too just in using basically nothing but lyricism and instrumentation which is just yeah. like god when i first I mean, heard this man this is it, it was just so mind-blowing and it still is yeah no i think Gosh, like, I think the use of repeated imagery here is so, so integral to what's, what's done well. Like, I love the, I love guns and weapons constantly being brought up as a lyrical motif because it adds this atmosphere of like, is he going to harm himself, others? He's got the shooting range. We just... You, I can't say I've ever felt more like tense and on edge for a character in in a song on an album than than this one because you really feel like he could snap at any moment and it's just a it it it's that sense of doom that dread that oppression that that runs so deep in this album's. Uh, music 
you feel yes. helpless as a listener, which is a very yeah. like, you know, uh, a very upsetting way to feel like, uh, in the context of listening to a record, like you might expect that maybe from like a really like powerful movie or something, but, and I want to talk about, uh, the closing track here, sleep together, because it's kind of like a weird fusion of some of the things I don't care for as much in this record. And some of the things that I really love about it, which is that like, I get the point of this song like conceptually like it's like the back slide into like the the downward spiraling the you know the 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 lack of visible escape from the scenario and the sense of which we have to just engage in whatever mindless numbing behaviors we can and that's fine I think it's a little a little bit trite lyrically but I can slightly overlook that the thing I really like about the song is how like it is the most 80s like kitschy sounding song to me like this song would fit right in on like pretty hate machine and when i listen to it i get those very like those uh, early nine inch nails kind of like uh slash late 80s early 90s depeche mode vibes except with like you know these ornate string arrangements and the sense of like you know uh higher production quality heft than that music ever had and it's like it evokes string arrangements sound it, so good it evokes like so much stuff that's really nostalgic to me musically and it's and for that reason it's like even though i think that it's some of the most trite lyricism here it's like one of the songs that i get the most pleasure out of listening to weirdly enough um because of how kind of kitschy and corny it sounds instrumentally and, and and how it sort of leans into that like even like with the strings like yeah they sound great they're amazing but they're also like pretty melodramatic and it's kind of just all part and parcel of um what this record is essentially it's it's, it's this big melodramatic emotional heavily involved um maybe slightly a little bit you know uh too contrived in certain parts but that's kind of the cost of the sort of record that Stephen wants to make and the sort of way he wants to present this perspective he certainly is exaggerating it to a certain extent for dramatic purposes and artists are allowed to do that so I think it's an interesting way to end the record um, and it maybe is a good way to end my thoughts on it because it's emblematic of everything I love about this record and emblematic of everything that I think will keep it from being like one of my favorite por porcupine tree records all the same. So yeah, I'm, I'm frustratingly un, un, unsimple today in my feelings, but it's a, it's a great record. I've heard it dozens of times probably by now, at least a dozen. And I still enjoy listening to it from front to back. And I like how, much it's just like pure ded purely dedicated to being as musically awesome as possible um and that's something i appreciate in in a record like this like we don't know how the new porcupine tree record is going to turn out um but what i sincerely hope won't happen is that it turns out to be a record where stephen wilson and co take themselves entirely too seriously and make a really solemn a uh, prog rock record because a lot of what's most enjoyable about porcupine tree is the sense with which steven and co kind of are aware of how kind of ridiculous it all is and sort of really lean into that and give you the prog excess that you want when you're in that headspace and and fear no, of blank yeah. planet is a record that does that in spades I, i'd say that's a great remark because i don't even really disagree with you about your point about some of the overly melodramatic parts of this record especially sleep together which is not the most originally written song ever uh but yeah no that's absolutely a great point that the instrumentation carries this album just picturing the smile on everyone's faces while they're playing this the the excitement the joy, the verve, the chemistry, that's what makes this album fun. Because even though this is dark, gloomy, depressing shit, you still are just having such a great time because of how over the top and maximalist the instrumentation is. Like, there becomes a point when this album could be about shitting and farting and I wouldn't care. It's, <laughs> it's so badass. Yeah, I mean that's 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 it that's that's you see the vision
I mean, I, I the, the worst case scenario is that Closure Continuation is being a concept ra- album about like Brexit, which uh, I'll give it like a three uh, <laughs> in, in that case. Um, I guess I'll create a mild defense of Sleep Together in which it's like, it's really that the lyrics here, it, it, it's that they're only really describing one thing happening in this, which is kind of why the simplicity and frankly minimalism of it is fine by me is because it's just sort of like this is the point where you know it's it's an ambiguous ending it's like it did the catharsis that was yielded on way out of here result in implosion or did it result in something that was you know the character was able to to move on or move past and it's sort of the this one moment of solace and you know taking it forward leaving like what it whatever it's going to yield and i mean i just think it kicks a lot of ass frankly yeah it, it certainly stands out as a closer among porcupine tree records because like with the last two you have some of my favorite album closers ever and collapse the light into earth and glass arm shattering and they're these beautifully tasteful and kind of spare and and very traditionally pretty songs and this is just like not really tasteful at all not really pretty at all certainly not spare it has this incredibly dated synth sound that I fucking love I can't tell you how much I love that warbly synth sound and it's just like everything it's kind of the inverse of of what you would expect from a porcupine tree closer at this point and it kind of emphasizes the uniqueness of this record even among the other albums in this discography and and why you know if you're in a particular mood for this particular record then or what this record does then this is you know there's no other choice this is the one to put on if you're in if you want to get into that space yeah some fucking nail on the head (laughs) yeah i want to point out to one instrument uh that we haven't really shouted out before that I think is definitely uh, one of the standout parts to me is I think the bass playing on Sleep Together is fucking gnarly as yes. fuck. Absolutely. Colin Edwin, we respect. No, yes, I, Colin Edwin's I mean, contributions awesome. to this album. Fuck yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, the bass, while I would say it doesn't do like as comparatively much for the atmosphere as the synth does, it's still quite, mm-hmm. uh, it, it's still important enough to the atmosphere. I mean, it's not exactly post-punk, but that's because it's progressive <laughs> rock. Hell yeah. All right, well, shall we do our favorite tracks and ratings then for Fear of a Blank Planet? I just want that to be the quote that they put on the box for something. It's just be like, it's not like it's post-punk. It's progressive rock. And then someone reading it and be like, you know what? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. I'm down with the clown on this one. The ICP. The Jake, what are your <laughs> what are your favorite tracks and rating? Um, my favorite half of the album is uh, "Gotta Say" and "Esthetize." Um, "Gotta Say" way out of here, and I'm gonna say "My Ashes." Uh, least favorite song. I don't have one. This is a perfect album. 10 out of 10. Um, August. For me, favorites are going to be Fear of a Blank Planet, My Ashes, and Way Out of Here. Not that Anesthetize isn't in my top three. I'm just not going to put it there because I have to have some bone of originality. Hmm. Uh, Didn't really talk about this track myself, but I, I would say my least favorite is Sentimental. Anyway, no, it gets not allowed. No, okay, not allowed. Okay, fine. Uh, this album gets a zero out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, shit. No, it's a nine for me. It's a nine out of ten. All right. Well, I know Morgan has this at a ten, so I've put his rating in as well. I will say my three favorite tracks are same as Jake. Uh, Anesthetize way out of here in my ashes. Uh, least favorite track is yeah it's definitely sentimental and i would give this album an 8.5 which means that overall we have an average rating of 9.4 
for Porcupine Tree's Fear of a Blank Planet. Let us know at home what you think of Porcupine Tree's Fear of a Blank Planet. Is it your favorite Porcupine Tree album? Where does it go in your ranking of the Porcupine Tree albums? And what do you think of our opinions and interpretations? We want to hear from you in the comments below. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple, then head on over to the YouTube link in the description and get, leave us a comment there if you want to. Make sure that if you enjoyed this episode, you like the video and subscribe to the channel if you have not already. Both of those things help us out a lot to be able to keep doing this. We will be back with another, the Record Club on the incident much closer to the release of uh, Closer Continuation so stick around for that as well if you want to go above and beyond and support the channel you can hit the join button and for just one dollar a month you can support the channel and have your name featured in the title call of every episode in this channel as well as priority comment response and if you want to recommend us a record to listen to your recommendation will go to the top of the pile no one has done that yet so I'm like I'm waiting for someone to take advantage of the fact that I say that in every video we yeah, do so, someone someone, someone is make gonna us gonna do it then he's gonna make us review fear and <laughs> make us listen to something yeah yeah fuck it I, 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 I tell you what, if we do ever get big enough to have like a, a Patreon or like a thing where we have a poll where we actually have to like do a video on an album that wins the poll, then mm. I, I look for, if that day ever comes, then I have no doubt we will, <laughs> we will be truly tortured. Um, oh my gosh. You know what? No, I, I, I'm going to say it right here. 2000 subscribers special, fear inoculum. I'll do it. No, we can figure You heard yes. it here, folks. 2,000 subs, you're getting fear inoculum. How about this? 2,000 subs, and we'll do the full tool discography. <laughs> oh, fuck yeah. Let's go. Fuck yeah, Absolutely. 2,000 subs, tool discog. But we've got to get All to it by the we've got to get to 2,000 before the end of the year. Otherwise, it won't, otherwise, it doesn't count. So get us to 2K uh, before the end of the year, and we'll review every tool album. Every, every tool album, every tool EP every tool side project Shut up, stop talking <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll review green jelly red jelly perfect circle half circle quarter circle square fucking all of it yeah that shitty music video they did when they were a perfect circle for that protest album they made <laughs> oh man that um so good. good yeah all right um August, why don't you send us home? As always, folks, uh, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Xbox, power your dreams. <laughs>